All right, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome uh, one of the world's most foremost uh, researchers in bioelectronics, uh, John Rogers. Uh, he is a he is the Lewis Simpson and Kimberly Query Professor of Material Science and Engineering, Biomedical Engineering and Me Medicine at Northwestern University, and he also serves as director of the Query Simpson Institute for Bioelectronics. Uh, before joining Northwestern, he was faculty at my current institution, University of Illinois, um, but I promise it wasn't my fault he left. Uh, it, we did not overlap. Uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Medicine, the National Academy of Inventors, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, he has been recognized by numerous awards, including a MacArthur Fellowship, the Lemelson MIT Prize, the Smithsonian Award, the Benjamin Franklin Medal, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. Uh, he will be giving his talk entitled Wireless Skin Conformal Devices for Health Monitoring and Haptic Interactions, and let's give him a warm welcome. All right, thank, thank you, Chris, Chris, for that uh, kind introduction. It's a <clears throat> real pleasure to be here. I have to admit, um, you know, I don't have enough opportunities to interact with this particular community. It's a little bit outside of my core areas of expertise, but I'm excited because um, I think a lot of the things that we work on have very powerful potential synergies with the field of robotics. And um, so I'll share some, some of our work with you, but, but keep in mind um, th those potential areas for collaboration, and I'd be happy to you know, have follow-up discussions with anybody who identifies you know, uh, areas of, of overlap that might be uh, interesting to, to explore. So uh, as Chris mentioned, um, you know, I'm at Northwestern. My core expertise is in material science and engineering, but we do a lot in the space of bioelectronics and biomedical engineering. And um, in this talk, I'll sort of summarize what we've been doing in those fields um, and try, as I move through the talk, to highlight opportunities where these platforms might be useful to consider as input-output uh, interfaces to, to robotic systems. So devices that either mount uh, on the human body who's controlling a robot or robotic skins that may provide you know, an enhanced sense of uh, uh, range of capabilities in, uh, uh, for the robot to perceive its physical uh, surroundings. And so, so the title of the talk, as was mentioned, is sort of wireless skin conformal devices. So these advanced uh, classes of microsystems technologies, electronic, optoelectronic, photonic, and even vibrohaptic uh, microelectromechanical systems that are designed to be compatible with the human body. And in general, with moving curved surfaces that one might encounter in the field of robotics, mainly for healthcare monitoring, uh, monitoring physiological health, mental health, that sort of thing. Uh, but also more recently as, as a capability for um, generating haptic interactions that could be uh, useful for virtual environments that go beyond just visual and audio cues. And I think it's really that area that may have the strongest um, you know, potential for intersection with, with this, this particular community of robotics. So I'll start a little bit uh, with, with a background and, and give you a sense of the technology foundations, but I'm going to go pretty quickly and not um, sort of dwell on the, on the underlying ideas or the material science, but try to give you a sense of the technical maturity, the kinds of platforms that are possible uh, currently, and, and the range of capabilities, both, both in sort of medicine uh, but as well in this uh, area of uh, virtual and augmented uh, reality, sort of skin interface devices that provide, you know, haptic cues and, and a sensation of touch uh, to complement video and audio inputs. Um, we do have actually a small effort in robotics as, um, you know, conventionally um, uh, conceived and uh, as bonus content, if I have time at the end of the presentation, I'll give you a sense of what we're doing in that space. I think we built the world's smallest terrestrial micro robots to give you a sense of what that's all about as well. Again, if I, if I have time. <clears throat> so as Chris mentioned, I'm at Northwestern. We have um, a unique institute um, you know, at, at Northwestern. I'm um, you know, fortunate enough to serve as the director of that institute that really facilitates research uh, at the boundaries between engineering science and medical science. So trying to develop new uh, technologies that can have a positive impact on human health, improve patient outcomes, reduce costs, uh, and change the way that we think about delivering uh, health care uh, in, into the future. Uh, and so what, what that involves is, um, at least in part, um, an attempt to kind of reformulate 
Uh, the classes of electronics that currently serve as the foundations for consumer electronics gadgetry into platforms that are, compa uh, that are compatible with soft tissue systems that you encounter in the uh, biological world, the human body uh, specifically. And so this is probably one of the world's most successful forms of technology, the CMOS integrated circuit. It's very powerful. But if you think about the physical properties, you think about the kinds of constituent materials that are used to form these um, integrated circuits, they're highly mismatched uh, from the sort of textured soft uh, time dynamic uh, surfaces of, of, of the body. I mean, this platform is uh, completely planar uh, to be aligned with the kinds of um, optical and, and photolithographic procedures that are used to fabricate these devices. They're built on rigid platforms of high modulus materials like silicon wafers, silicon carbide, for example, that don't bend and um, you know, they fracture easily. And so um, what we've uh, strived to do as uh, you know, material scientists is overcome those uh, physical uh, constraints in, in integrating this class of technology with the human body by developing new uh, materials, new manufacturing strategies, new design strategies to enable soft forms of electronics. And you might ask, well, what's that going to be good for? Well, I think one, one of the most obvious examples would be to take this kind of technology and interface it with the human brain. So bring man's most sophisticated form of electronics into intimate interfaces with uh, biology's most sophisticated form of electronics to maybe as research tool to understand you know, the basic operating principles of the brain or to deliver engineering forms of medicine to treat various uh, sorts of uh, uh, brain uh, disorders or maybe into the future as the basis for a, a brain machine interface. Again, as a control system perhaps for uh, interfacing with an external uh, ro robotic system. And so like I said, I'm, I'm not gonna dwell on the underlying uh, foundations of what we've been able to do, but just uh, sort of cut to the chase and um, make the statement that at this point we can create skin-like forms of electronics that have all the sophistication that you would see in a microprocessor that's in your in your smartphone. And the way that we do that is we start with the wafer. We create a very thinned uh, version of uh, those integrated circuits, reduce the thickness of the overall system by a factor of a thousand or so. That renders uh, mechanical bendability just due to the fact that the flexural rigidity scales with the cube of the thickness uh, of the material. We split it into very tiny parts and then we interconnect those parts with um, uh, uh, serpentine uh, interconnects. Uh, that provide an out-of-plane buckling mechanics that when embedded in a soft elastomer give you uh, a soft stretchable uh, set of physical characteristics that can be tailored to really match an interface point uh, of interest across the body, skin, brain, heart, uh, bladder, um, kidney, and other places where we deployed this kind of technology. So you think about it from a design standpoint, now you're considering circuit design as a primary uh, driver in how you do the layouts, but now you're also coupling circuit design with mechanics design. Uh, and we do that through full 3D uh, finite element modeling of the mechanics of these hard, soft, hybrid material systems. So you can do all of that, and um, it turns out that um, that, that, that works, works very well, and um, you can create uh, devices now that can be interfaced with any location across the human body persistently uh, to, to sort of blur the distinction between uh, the artificial system and, and, and the living system for purposes in uh, health monitoring. So this was an early device of that type that we published in 2011, just illustrating that we felt like we had you know, a handle on basically how to do this form of soft electronics, where we uh, develop systems that have all of the physical attributes of the epidermis itself. So not just the, uh, the modulus and the range of stretchability, the bendability, for example, the flexural rigidity, bending stiffness, but also the uh, aerial mass density, the thermal mass, uh, the uh, water vapor uh, permeability and so on. So you can almost think of this as a second skin that goes on your natural skin to establish a physical interface that allows you to reproduce a lot of the clinical grade measurements that are currently confined to uh, hospital settings. Now deployable into the home, operating in a wireless fashion for continuous monitoring of health, not episodic evaluations uh, that, are, that currently serve as the basis for how we do uh, health care. So that was 2011, we got a little bit better in 2014. And from that point on, we really focused on adapting and engineering these kinds of systems to address specific unmet clinical needs. And I'll give you some examples um, in the next few slides. But there's a whole sort of zoology of these kinds of devices. The idea being that you can create uh, platforms that can mount at any location of the anatomy. You can think about these as wearable devices, but not constrained to the wrist or the finger. You can place them 
on any relevant part of the anatomy to address a particular uh, measurement requirement. Each device can include multiple classes of sensors, and you can mult, uh, mount multiple devices at different locations across the body and um, do read out in a highly time-synchronized manner to get kind of full body assessments of health processes, all without the wires and uh, without the need for uh, hospital apparatus. So there are a number of different kinds of sensors that have been developed over the years, not only by my group as a sort of a global uh, uh, community now uh, working in this space, precise thermal characterization, not only spatial temporal mapping of millikelvin variations in the temperature of the surface of the skin, but also quantitative measurements of thermal transport characteristics, heat capacity, thermal diffusivity, thermal conductivity, and so on. All sorts of electrical sensors as well, so you can pick up biopotential, you can pick up uh, brain waves, uh, electrocardiograms, uh, electrical activity associated with cardiac cycles, muscle activity, uh, motion of the, uh, of the eyes, for example. You can embed in these same platforms microfluidic channels, and so you can capture micro and nanoliter volumes of sweat, eccrine sweat, as it emerges from the surface of the skin, and you can do biomarker analysis of, of sweat as a non-invasive uh, analog and correlate to, uh, to blood chemistry. All kinds of mechanical sensors as well, strain, motion, modulus, uh, pressure, and get kinematics. You can measure uh, volume changes. Optical uh, sensors, optoelectronic devices drop very naturally into these types of uh, frameworks. So you can do blood oxygenation, for example, other kinds of optical measurements of uh, tissue properties. You can also measure body sounds. So you can reproduce the kinds of function that you uh, would associate with a stethoscope, but now in these wireless patches that could be mounted at various locations across the body. So you can do cardiac auscultation, for example. So each device is multimodal. You can stack up multiple sensors in any individual platform. As I mentioned, you can operate them as a multinodal bo body area network uh, as well, all time synchronized to microsecond levels of, um, of precision. Uh, with clinical grade quality. So that, that's an aspiration and a goal that we've been able to meet. So you can reproduce ICU grade measurements, but again, continuously in a home setting. Um, at cost points that would allow this type of technology to be uh, deployed uh, around the globe, not just in um, you know, um, expensive um, healthcare facilities like, that we have, uh, like we have here in the uh, United States. I'll give examples of that in the next few minutes. <clears throat> so, the class of patient that we focused on initially was one that we thought could benefit most strongly from this kind of wireless skin-like technology, and that uh, class of patient happens to be premature babies. And so if you've ever uh, experienced what, what happens in the neonatal uh, intensive care unit, you'll realize that it's a highly primitive, highly non-ideal uh, engineering solution to the problem of continuous monitoring of all vital signs, because these uh, patients are in a very fragile health status, their vital signs need to be monitored 24-7 uh, so that healthcare professionals can uh, engage uh, as necessary. And that's currently done by hardwired uh, interfaces that join uh, skin-mounted uh, uh, biosensors uh, affixed to the surface of the skin with adhesive tapes to external boxes of data acquisition electronics. This is the way that it's done, even in the most sophisticated level four NICUs that we have uh, in Chicago, for example. Uh, but the problem is that the tapes can uh, induce damage to the skin uh, upon removal, and they have to be removed on a 12, 24-hour cycle as part of the standard of clinical care because the skin in these babies is highly underdeveloped. It's very fragile. It's almost like an open wound, and so that represents a risk factor. The presence of the wires actually is a natural constraint to uh, movements of the baby, and so that's uh, that, that's not non-ideal, and it also frustrates the kind of parent-child interactions that are known to be so important for therapeutic development uh, of the baby at, at this stage of their lives. And so this was a power of uh, Photoshop uh, illustration of what we were hoping to do. This is back in 2016 or so, is right, get rid of this rat's nest of wires and the invasive tapes and replace that with one or two of the, or three of these uh, skin-like wireless devices to improve the care of these patients. And it turns out you can do all of that and I won't go into the details, we published this in spring of 2019, so with a pair of devices, skin-like in their physical properties, wireless and battery-free in their operation, you can reproduce all of the vital signs that are currently measured with those wired-based setups. Uh, one of them goes on the chest, the other one goes on the limb. The one on the chest is capturing electrocardiograms from which you can determine heart rate, heart rate variability, respiration rate. There's also a clinical grade 
digital uh, temperature sensor uh, in this chest unit, which is a pretty good approximation of core body temperature. And then the other device is going on the limb to determine uh, blood oxygenation. They're time synchronized, so we're also getting hemodynamic uh, information as well, actually going beyond what's done in the NICU uh, facility today. So this is a 26-week gestational age baby, one of about 200 premature babies that we've tested the technology on through our collaborations uh, with folks at Lee, uh, Lurie Children's Hospital. This hand here is uh, the hand of Aaron Hombus, who's head of neonatology. Uh, at Lurie's, you can see our device here, and we do all of our measurements in parallel with uh, conventional um, assessments using these uh, wire-based devices to establish quantitative equivalency between skin-like wireless and the traditional wired-based systems. So that's turned out to work very well for monitoring in the NICU. It's actually um, propagated beyond the NICU into the PICU, so this is the pediatric intensive care unit. Slightly larger babies, but in most cases, in challenging uh, health uh, situations that require 24-7 vital signs monitoring. And the wireless skin-like platforms that I just described to you are very beneficial for those classes of patients as well. And so you can see uh, a baby here in the PICU at uh, Prentice Women's Hospital, also downtown Chicago. You can see the device on the chest there measuring the parameters I mentioned before, device on the foot that's getting blood, blood oxygenation. And we can determine the time delay between when a pulse of blood is initiated from a cardiac cycle as measured with this device and the time arrival of that pulse of blood uh, at the foot. And it turns out that that pulse arrival time and the equivalent pulse wave velocity is a pretty good surrogate for uh, blood pressure. So you get a beat-to-beat, -beat, non-invasive measurement of blood pressure as well. So these are wireless and battery-free in their operation. We use a magnetic inductive uh, wireless link for uh, power delivery and also data communication. It's happening through an antenna, in this case, that's uh, mounted on the base of the chair. So that's what it looks like. Here's the raw data. I won't get into the details, but the, the data is illustrated up here. This is ECG. Uh, this is photoplasmography. These are the optical measurements that you need to, to assess uh, blood oxygenation. Uh, and those are three uh, raw data streams, very important. We actually, uh, in this instance, are also going beyond what's the standard of care because we have a high bandwidth accelerometer in the chest unit. And so we actually get cardiac sounds. Uh, this is seismocardiography, uh, and so you can measure the sounds of the opening and closing of the valves in the heart. And that provides information that's complementary to the electrical characteristics associated with a beat cycle as embodied by the electrocardiograms. You also get chest wall movements, so you can capture respiration rate using multiple data streams for redundancy. So this is all the raw data, tremendous amount of information there, and we're working on uh, advanced machine learning algorithms to try to tease out you know, subtleties associated with the shapes of these waveforms. But what's done currently in hospitals, you just take that data and you distill it down into very primitive parameters, just heart rate, and you can see the heart rate variability there as well, SpO2, that's blood oxygenation. You're getting this parameter from those two curves. Uh, this uh, curve is giving you the heart rate. You get respiration rate either from chest wall movements or for variations in the uh, peak of that R feature in the QRS complex. You get temperature, and uh, with a pair of devices, you also get variations in temperature between the core and uh, peripheral locations, such as the foot and, and the hand, and that provides additional insights into cardiovascular health. So we published those uh, results in uh, spring of 2019, very shortly after we were approached by program managers at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and folks at the Save the Children organization organization asking whether we could take those kinds of technologies and deploy them into lower and middle income countries where there's no monitoring hardware at all, wired or otherwise. And that uh, occurred to us as a great challenge. So we were able to take the devices that I just described to you, engineer them to allow for deployment in these very resource constrained areas of the globe at manufacturing uh, cost points that uh, would allow for uh, economic viability in the range of a few cents um, in terms of patient monitoring uh, days. And so <clears throat> we were able to do that. I won't get into the details. We published the results about a year later. And now we're deep into a scaled deployment of these devices, about 10,000 of them so far into India, Pakistan, Zambia, Kenya, and Ghana. And that started in uh, 2020. This is an example of uh, my students training healthcare professionals in Zambia on the use of these technologies. I think I was taking the picture here, spent a couple of weeks in Zambia to see how these technologies can impact not only how we treat, uh, you know, infants and newborns, you know, in the developed world, but, but also in these resource-constrained uh, air areas of the globe. So to just give you a sense of uh, kind of what, what's possible, we have a number of different, uh, these soft electronic technologies that I would say are entering this similar kind of translational pipeline, sort of moving them out of an academic laboratory context and into scaled production and deployment. We have startup companies that are configured to do that. I won't go through the details. We're doing a lot in maternal fetal uh, health as well as a natural extension of what we've done in the past in neonatal and pediatric health. But let me focus on 
uh, some challenges at the end of life. So we're very interested in beginning of life challenges, again, maternal, fetal, neonatal, pediatric, but also end of life health challenges that might uh, you know, represent areas of opportunity for these kinds of technologies. And there we work with Parkinson's patients, Alzheimer's patients, and stroke survivors. So this is an example of a device that we developed in um, response to a uh, request from rehabilitation physicians uh, at our Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. It's one of the largest rehabilitation hospitals uh, in, in the world in downtown Chicago. And one of the challenges they have is with stroke survivors, they have to relearn basic uh, things that we sort of take for granted. So they have to relearn how and when to swallow, for example. They have to relearn how to speak. And so they come into the rehabilitation uh, clinic, they go through various training protocols. In many cases, their condition improves while they're in the clinic, but a lot of those gains dissipate when they return to the home. So the request was for a device that would allow a physician to remotely monitor patterns of speaking and swallow dynamics uh, remotely and continuously in a home setting. And so we're able to do that. We developed a soft sort of Band-Aid-like device that mounts on a unique part of the anatomy. It's a soft tissue location at the base of the neck known as the suprasternal notch. And it includes a high bandwidth triaxis accelerometer sitting right at that location, wireless Bluetooth connectivity to a phone or an iPad with uh, embedded memory that allows for uh, on, on uh, sensor uh, data storage. And from that position, we're close enough to the throat, we can measure swallow events. We're coupled to the chest wall uh, cavity so we can measure when those swallows happen relative to the respiratory cycle. And we have enough bandwidth here, we can actually measure vibratory motions of the surface of the skin as an indication of speech without needing a microphone. And that turned out to be very important for a couple of reasons. One is the microphone uh, represents uh, an invasion of privacy. There are very few people who want everything that they say to be recorded with a microphone. You can't get anybody to sign up for that. The other thing is with a microphone, you uh, can easily be confounded by uh, ambient noises. And so this is a study group where we have uh, devices monitored on this individual and this individual. They're having conversation with one another, but this device is only responding to speech patterns of the person who's wearing the device and likewise for this person as well. And it doesn't produce an, audi uh, an audible uh, a signature of voice. It just uh, captures a pattern of vocalization, tonality, and, um, and cadence, uh, which, which is what the rehabilitation specialists actually need and want. So this device was designed initially to measure swallow and speech in the context of aphasia and dysphagia uh, associated with stroke survivors. But it turns out that this is a very information-rich location of the body for measuring uh, physiological parameters relevant, relevant to health. I mean, you might ask your, uh, yourself the question, if you have one wearable device, where would you put it on the body to capture the ri most rich, broadest, and deepest uh, set of data associated with health? And we think the suprasternal notch may be the answer to that question because uh, you get speech and swallowing, which is what the device was originally designed for, but you're actually close enough to the carotid arteries so you can actually measure motion signatures associated with pulsatal flow of blood up through the carotid. So you actually, from that data, you can get heart rate and heart rate variability. As I mentioned before, you're also coupled to the chest wall cavity, so you get motions associated with respiration, so you get respiration rate. You also get respiration sounds, so you can capture sounds of wheezing. You can count coughs, for example. You can determine if it's a wet cough or a dry cough. You're coupled to the core body, so you get core body uh, orientation. And of course, you can just capture activity levels as well, because you can monitor uh, steps and, and motion in that, say, in that way. So it's one device, a very simple device, only requiring a mechanical coupling to the skin, but tremendous amount of data associated with the recordings. And so what does that look like? This is uh, raw data collected from that device, so it's a triaxis accelerometer. Again, Z is the out-of-plane direction, normal to the surface of the skin, and you can kind of see the different features here. So it's mounted on an individual sitting still initially. You can see the cycles associated with respiration, but you also see this fuzzy stuff here. If you zoom in, those are the cardiac sounds. Those are pulsatile signatures of blood flow coming through the carotid. You uh, continue here, and the individual starts to talk. You can see very well-defined oscillatory signatures of speech with associated harmonics. And so even though these features could be overlapping in time, they have unique spectral characteristics. So you can develop simple bandpass band filtering approaches to separate out all these activities and quantify them, even though they appear in just a single time series of data. Here's a swallow. This is a very characteristic feature. You can't confuse that with talking or cardiac activity, so you can count swallows very easy. And then walking and running correspond to very high amplitude motions uh, that you can uh, likewise separate from these other features. <clears throat> so with a set of digital filters, 
You can take the raw data and you can distill it down into energy expenditure, for example, heart rate, heart rate variability, respiration rate, swallow count, and talk time, just as very simple metrics uh, that, that people are interested in, in, in measuring. So this is what some raw data looks like from a Parkinson's patient who's undergoing therapy around swallowing. And the raw data is shown in the upper uh, graph here, and so it kind of looks like a noisy set of data with a little bit of oscillation superimposed. It's actually not noise. So if you apply a bandpass filter that um, allows uh, sig uh, signals associated with frequencies between 20 and 50 hertz to pass, you capture all the cardiac signature. And you pull that out, you do peak finding, you determine heart rate, heart rate variability. Then you can take this data, you subtract it away, and what you're left with is very high qu uh, signal and noise um, you know, measurements of oscillatory behaviors associated with inspiration and expiration. So you're getting depth of respiration and also respiration rate. But what's interesting here is you're also capturing swallow events. Difficult to see in the raw data, but they show up very nicely here after you do this bandpass filtering and subtraction. There's a swallow, there's another one, there's another one. So you can count how often swallows are happening. It's very important because a Parkinson's patients, stroke survivors, for example, many times don't swallow frequently enough, which is why you see some of these individuals drooling, for example. They're just not swallowing enough. And so this is a device that allows you to quantify swallowing and provide that as feedback to the patient so they can learn how to swallow at a normal cadence. The other thing that turns out to be important with swallows is it's not just uh, that you have to swallow frequently enough, but you have to swallow at the right time point relative to the respiratory phase. And so naturally, and you probably do, do this un unconsciously, you swallow at the peak of inspiration or the depth of expiration. You never swallow halfway in between. And if you do, you'll choke yourself, and that can be a life-threatening type of thing. So here, the, the patient is swallowing more or less appropriately here, 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 maybe slipping up a little bit here. So you get a lot, lot of information, sing, single device of that type. So what does it look like, those kind of measurements as they're done today in a rehab clinic, like um, you know the number one re, uh, ranked rehabilitation hospital in Chicago? Well, it consists of a, a couple of things. It's uh, these uh, respiratory inductance, uh, inductance plethysmography bands, uh, that mount on the upper and the lower chest, uh, and then nasal cannulas that allow you to measure airflow. And they use airflow variations to determine when swallows occur, and they're using these rip bands to ca uh, capture those cycles of uh, respiration. And these devices then connect through hardwired connections to uh, data acquisition electronics, allow you to record all of this and provide real-time feedback to the, to the patient. So the idea is get rid of all of that, <clears throat> allow for a, a much more accurate and much more natural way to do rehab while they're in the clinic, but in a form factor and a platform that can deploy to the home. So here's what it is. It's the device on the supersternal notch, and this is real-time streaming to an iPad that's doing real-time data analytics. So it's, again, it's just simple bandpass filtering. You get the respiratory signal here. You get the high-frequency stuff here. You can identify the swallows here, and you can see exactly providing visual cues to the uh, patient as to when they're swallowing, how often they're swallowing, and, and when those swallows are happening rel uh, relative to the respiratory cycle. Now, this is the transition where I'll focus more on haptics, which is... It's fine if you're looking at the screen, you get all this information, but a lot of times you might not want to have to stare at your smartphone or stare at your iPad. So there, uh, you know, having a fiber or haptic interface to the body can create uh, you know, uh, non-visual, non-audio cues to, to the patient to create an awareness. So what we did here is this is a multi-haptic um, interface. It's a band that goes around the wrist. It's Bluetooth connected to this sensor. We do in-sensor analytics here, passes the swallow information, the respiratory information, and provides vibratory um, uh, signals to, to the patient to let them know, know what's going on with their, um, with their swallow behavior. Now that might seem like a very narrow targeted application, and perhaps it is, but it got us thinking more broadly about skin interface devices, not just for sensing, but also for providing information uh, to, to the uh, individual using skin as, as the interface and maybe creating an artificial sense of touch. And so you think about what, what uh, types of devices involve haptic feedback. There are lots of them. You know, game controllers, uh, smart watches, um, smartphones, uh, industrial equipment, and so on. So handheld devices, vibrating motor, it's fine. It's a pretty primitive type of haptic interface, but it's one that's been around for a while. And so we took a look at what is the history of haptic and it involves a lot of those kind of portable devices that may be predated from desktop systems that have haptic uh, vibrators uh, built in, and they, they engage through the fingertips when you 
uh, you know, interact with, with the device. Moving into uh, gloves, where the haptic engagement is really focused on the fingertips. Lots of uh, work has been done in that space uh, over the years. But then looking to the future, maybe thinking about these skin-like devices for haptic engagement beyond the fingertips to the entire body. Like what would that look like and, and, and would that be sort, sort of interesting maybe uh, you know, for application not only in medicine but, but again as maybe control interface to, to ro uh, control interfaces to robotic systems and we know a lot about how to make electronics into skin-like forms. Could we kind of leverage that for haptic devices uh, as well? And the, so the whole emergence of this metaverse is sort of, you know, amplifying, you know, di directions that we are going anyway. In, anyway. And uh, you may have seen, um, you know, YouTube videos of the latest devices out of uh, the meta reality, reality labs in, um, in, um, in Seattle. And um, I mean, these are sort of wearable robots, I guess is the way you can think about it. And so I haven't really decided if that's interesting or frightening, but, but anyway, it's a, it's a device to create sort of a, a haptic engagement to go beyond just the visual and audio um, components of VR systems as they exist today. And so we've been interested in this uh, for a while, it sort of dates back to 2012. We have like a finger cuff and we're using electrotactile stimulators. So these are um, pairs of electrodes. You can inject current, you can directly excite haptic um, um, uh, to, uh, haptic sensors uh, in, in, the, in the fingertips and create kind of a, a rough sense of touch uh, in that way. It's not, not that ideal, however, because the threshold between creating a sensation and causing pain is very narrow, and you have a uh, variation in the skin impedance due to uh, you know, insensible sweating and uh, moisture that builds up in the skin. So it's very difficult to build a robust uh, haptic interface using a, electrical uh, stimulation. And so there's a lot of work going on in different groups, uh, you know, focus on mechanical, uh, you know, stimulators and, uh, you know, ranging from dielectric elastomers, piezoelectric uh, uh, options, soft pneumatics as a basis of soft robotics, but now adapted for, you know, body interface. Again, focused on the um, fingertips, but we think, you know, the fingertips only a small fraction of the, of, of the uh, you know, kind of haptic interface that you might want to think about into the future. And so this is our first kind of demonstration of a epidermal or skin-like, you know, haptic interface beyond the fingertips. And so it mounts on the uh, inner forearm. It has the ability to measure muscle contractions through EMG electromyograms, uh, but it also has these electrotactile stimulators. And so we're using this as an interface to control a robotic arm. And so we um, have um, you know, a haptic interface that uh, couples and is responsive to uh, the responsive pressure sensors that are integrated uh, into the end effector uh, associated with the robot. So it creates sort of ability to modulate pressure uh, during the control process. I'll come back to that in the context of amputees in a little while. So that's uh, kind, of, kind of a little bit of a background. And so <clears throat> we started to accelerate our efforts in this space maybe 2017 or so. And this is uh, kind of a first attempt at a platform that could do full body engagement at the, at the level of a haptic, haptic interface. And so it consists of an array of vibrotactile um, actuators that can be controlled in a fast, real-time, spatio-temporal manner using a back plane of soft electronics uh, as a control system. And the whole thing sort of stacks up like this. Uh, and so it's, it's flexible and can kind of conform to the curved textures of the body and move naturally with, with motions of the limbs, uh, for, for example. Now, the kind of mechanical actuators you're using here are very primitive, very simple, uh, but they work. Uh, and we can produce hundreds of them, which is what, what we need to do in the lab to, to, to build these things at any kind of realistic scale. So it involves just a Lorentz force. We have a neodymium uh, rare earth magnet. We have a, a copper coil. We can modulate current flow through the coil to create a force on the magnet. It sits on a cantilevered um, platform of a thin uh, polymer membrane. We can control the shape of this to define the resonant frequency. We define the resonance frequency to align with the highest um, response of the mechanoreceptors in the skin. Uh, it turns out to be about 200 hertz, and you can stack these up and use soft elastomers to create you know, the, the individual actuators, and you tile them out. You put the back plane of soft electronics on, 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 on the back of these things, and then you uh, ha have a control strategy in that way. We're using the same kind of magnetic inductive links that I described for the NICU vital signs monitoring uh, technologies for power delivery wirelessly, so there's no batteries in these systems, and for uh, wireless two-way communication. Uh, with, with the device. And so we use uh, RFID tag reader technology for doing that power delivery and data communication. We have various ways to increase the range. It's about a half meter or so. So if you're sitting in a chair, it's fine. You put it at the base of the chair, you're sitting in a hospital bed, yeah, that, that, that would work uh, as well. So I won't go into the details, but it's 13.56, is sort of standard NFC 
uh, low uh, high frequency uh, RF uh, link, again, for power and for data that connects a, a touch screen to the device. And so you stroke your finger across the touch screen and that creates a corresponding pattern of actuation across these vibrotactile uh, actuators. And so that's uh, the GUI and, and, and kind of what it looks like. So what's it good for? A <clears throat> number of different things. I won't go into the details, but you might imagine social media. So, you know, you're interacting with Zoom, you got the audio, the video, it's great. Might be interesting to be able to touch through the skin in a virtual way uh, the, the person that you're corresponding or interacting with, uh, and we can do that, and, and, and we can do that in real time. I'll give you some examples of that in a little bit. All kinds of uh, applications in gaming and entertainment, obviously, uh, but also things that really touch uh, medical care, and, and I'll fo focus on this one a little bit uh, in, in a few slides in terms of sensory substitution uh, that allows an individual with a robotic prosthetic uh, you know, for, for someone who's suffered from a, a lower uh, limb amputation, an ability to sort of feel objects through patterns of um, uh, haptic uh, engagement at the, at the upper arm. So that's what it was in, in 2019. We got a lot better. This was just published this week, actually. Much, much thinner, much more highly functional, more uh, dense collections of these uh, actuators at, um, at densities actually that exceed the two-point discrimination threshold for nearly all regions of the body except for the fingertips, the toes, and certain places on the face. And so these platforms can do full body engagement wherever you want to put them um, except for those locations. So the pitch here is about uh, half a centimeter or so. And again, that exceeds the two-point discrimination threshold for tactile receptors in uh, the vast majority of the, of the body. So you can put these on, on the back, on the, uh, on the upper arm, the lower arm, pretty much wherever you want. Uh, and you have multi-touch, um, real-time GUI interface for controlling the operation of those actuators. And not just patterns, but you can transmit information associated with pressure. If you have a pressure-sensitive touch screen, that can be translated into amplitudes of vibrations. You get the spatio-temporal, but you also get the amplitude information as well. Very easy to do that. So one of the postdocs working on this um, project actually developed sort of a Lego-style way to assemble these actuators into tiled arrays that have anatomically matched shapes. So you basically plug and play, you put these things together, and you can cover very large uh, areas in, in geometries that sort of you know, uh, match the natural contours of the body. You can in, embed them in stretchable fabrics as well to facilitate donning and doffing uh, of, of the devices. That's the way it works. So it's all compatible with uh, Bluetooth, NFC, wireless uh, communication protocols, but you can also uh, pass information through, through the internet, and you can do this with very low latencies, about 20 milliseconds or so. And so here's an example of a demonstration that shows that. So here you have touch screen. There's an individual in our Evanston labs. We still have some labs in Urbana well, from when I was on the faculty there at U of I. So the uh, student in Urbana is wearing one of these um, you know, epidermal virtual reality systems on his uh, outer uh, forearm. He can't see what's going on in Evanston, but the, but the student in Evanston is going to stroke his finger across this touch screen. That information is going to pass wirelessly through Bluetooth to a computer that's connected uh, wirelessly to the internet. That information gets transmitted again through a separate Bluetooth link to the epidermal VR system. And then this individual is going to write on this whiteboard uh, the characters that he's feeling on his uh, outer outer for forearm. And so all this is happening in, in, in real time. And so so. This, this individual is uh, stroking out uh, the letter V, and you see you know, th this guy is uh, writing out a V on, on the whiteboard, just to, as a visual in, uh, illustration that you know, it, it, it works, <laughs> I guess, is, is the point. So you might think that this is pretty simple. It's just stroking. You're just defining letters. Can you um, sort of replicate at some level different forms of engagement between fingers and the skin? So for example, uh, you can uh, map sort of a pinching deformation into uh, you know, a pattern of actuation that looks like this. We have LEDs here just to allow visualization or squeezing or twisting. And you can uh, imagine you know, many different types of um, you know, engagements, uh, two pattern stro uh, stroke, one, one finger, sorry, two finger stroke, one finger stroke, that, that type of thing. And then you might ask, well, can you tell the difference between all of those different patterns of actuation? It turns out to be pretty simple to do that. This is a truth table, and so we had a number of individuals uh, sort of learn these different uh, 
you know, sensations and, and they're quite, quite good at distinguishing one from the other based on that, that kind of uh, actuation applied to the, inner, uh, to the inner forearm. So let me give you this, this specific example of uh, you know, sensory substitution for robotic prosthetic control because this maybe begins to intersect, intersect uh, a little bit more obviously with, with this community. So the idea here is we have 30 pressure sensors uh, in this uh, robotic hand uh, and that, that information from each one of those pressure sensors passes through a Bluetooth link to the vibro uh, tactic, uh, tactile ha haptic array uh, mounted on the upper forearm. Uh, and this is uh, an Iraq war veteran who suffered a lower arm uh, amputation. So the control is happening through an EMG interface uh, in this um, socket uh, that forms the base of the uh, ro robotic hand. Uh, and then he can uh, you know, sort of develop a sense of feel of um, you know, touch through, through these sensors as reproduced uh, in vibrotactile um, you know, form on, on his upper, uh, upper uh, arm. And so this requires, as you might imagine, a little bit of a training process so that he can associate different patterns of pressure on the robotic hand with different patterns of haptic engagement on, on the upper, <coughs> upper forearm. But it turns out that that was very easy to do. And this uh, person could, could learn the, the system uh, quite quite quickly, and this is a pattern of um, uh, an, a video of, of him, uh, you know, do, doing that, doing that learning. And so now you can imagine you can um, much better control the, the, the robot in a sense. And so here's an example: he's blindfolded, the haptic array is off, and he's being asked to grasp this eggshell without breaking it. As you can imagine, it's almost impossible because he can't see what's going on. He can't feel how tightly the, the fingers are grasping the egg. And so when he tries to, to grasp it and pick it up, it's impossible to do that without <coughs> shattering the egg. However, even when he's um, blindfolded, when you have the uh, haptic array for sensory substitution turned on, now he can develop a sense of how tightly he's grasping the egg uh, and he can release the, the force uh, to, to allow him uh, to pick up the egg without uh, cracking it. So he can feel when he's contacting and he can feel the sense of the magnitude of the pressure, uh, and he can keep that pressure below a fracture threshold to pick up, the, uh, pick up the egg. So that's what it looks like. So what else might you do? I mean, you can think of the skin as an information uh, interface that's you know, typically underutilized, I guess, and um, it might be interesting as a complement to the eyes and the ears as, as a way to uh, sense the environment. And so here's a simple example. We have a naviga navigation app running on a phone, and now we're passing um, directional instructions to the haptic array. And so without um, you know, audio and, and without looking at the phone, uh, you, you can move through an environment just by feel. So you can uh, you know, feel different arrows and different symbols being reproduced on, on your back as a way to help guide, guide yourself through an environment. And so here's an example of 17 different kinds of instructions that can be passed in that way and can be accurately um, you know, assessed and distinguished you know, as illustrated uh, by, by results from this uh, tr truth table. So there's a lot of information content that come through that, that interface uh, so, sort of in real time. The other thing you can do is you can pair it in real time with a sensor. So here's the supersternal notch device. It has that uh, tracks as accelerometer. So you can determine the orientation of the device from, from the output of those accelerometers. You can transmit that information in real time to this uh, vibrohaptic uh, array to create you know, a sense of uh, body orientation for individuals who are undergoing rehab and need that kind of feedback. And so all this can happen in real time, Bluetooth connectivity from here to here. And you can see um, you know, different patterns of actuation corresponding different orientations of that, of that device. Just as another uh, example, exploratory use of uh, this kind of uh, technology. So let me describe kind of wild stuff so that may or may not make sense. But, but here, here's an example of a haptic re representation of music. So you're used to thinking about listening to music, but maybe there's a way to engage your skin to kind of enhance the experience of listening to music. So here's the most trivial way to kind of do that where we actually um, have the microphone activated on the phone. It's in real time computing uh, power spectra by FFT and then picking out the peaks in that power spectra, determining which notes are being played in any given time and then sending that information to map the notes that are being sensed to individual vibrohaptic uh, actuators across the array. So it's just a one-to-one -one -one mapping between notes and, um, and haptic um, actuators across this array. But this is a flight of the bumblebee. So this is real time. This is about the highest tempo you can go with this kind of real time uh, control. But it's pretty good 
Uh, it's impressive how much computational power you have on the phone. But anyway, this is what's, what's happening. It's sensing the notes. It's actuating the actuator. So maybe that's interesting, maybe not. We decided that maybe a more abstract way to convert the music into a haptic movie uh, might, might be more, more appealing. Uh, and so I asked my student to create like a video that represents flight of the bumblebee and then create a haptic representation of the motion of that bumblebee you know, across, uh, across the, uh, the array and you can do that as well. So a little bit more loosely coupled to the music, uh, but you can see the uh, bumblebee f floating around and then there's a corresponding pattern of actuation across the array. So if you're interested in reproducing the sense of a bumblebee craw crawling across your skin, we have the technology, so it's a real breakthrough in that sense, I guess. Uh, but maybe th this, this is m more interesting, a little bit more uh, abstraction and uh, different kinds of uh, uh, music converted into different uh, patterns of actuation. Again, trying to create you know, a haptic level of engagement in, in listening to music. So just kind of exploratory. So that's all I had to say, but um, I think there are tremendous opportunities for research in these kinds of platforms. The metaverse, I think, is going to accelerate activities in these areas. We're mostly interested in medical applications, but I think there are probably a lot of opportunities in robotic control interfaces uh, as well. But, but you really, really need work on everything. So I think it's just baby steps in the direction that we hope to go over time. Electronics, electromechanics, I think artificial muscles is something we really need. We don't really have that sensors, power supply, skin interfaces, software control, and so on. So with the last two minutes that I have, I think I'm 43 minutes in, I wanted to stop by, by for the 50 minute mark. Let me um, describe a, a couple of future, future opportunities. So the kinds of skin engagement that, that we're thinking about right now are the most, uh, the, sort of the most simplistic mechanisms that you can imagine. It's just a normal vibratory for, force being applied to the surface of the skin, but there are all kinds of skin receptors at different depths across the skin responding to different um, kinds of actuation. So DC, sort of constant forces, shear forces, there are thermal receptors. And so looking into the future, I think you can imagine multimodal operation in these devices, it's not just vibration, but static force, it's shear force, it's thermal actuation, local cooling and heating. And we're kind of working in that uh, direction, sort of leveraging uh, some of the stuff that, that we're able to do today, trying to improve the functionality of the, these devices and the level of engagement with, with the skin. And so with that, let me just give you one quick snapshot of what we're doing in robotics, because I love robotics and really enjoyed the talks uh, the, this morning. But you know, we're kind of newbies to, to this field, but we do have some kind of unusual and, and unique ideas that, that are maybe uh, interesting for the field of, of micro robots. And so we can create using these lithographic techniques that we leverage for these skin interface devices, all kinds of planar multi-material structures that can be buckled up out of the plane to create very tiny robots. And, and, and we do that with a stretched elastomer. We mount these planar structures and through um, a, a process of mechanical buckling associated with compressive stresses that follow from releasing that pre-strain, we can create all kinds of uh, very tiny 3D robots. And this is one that we built in the shape of a crab. And you can see the body of the crab here. It's a polymer-based body. We have shape memory alloy here at the joints, and we're using that shape memory alloy and the shape chains induced by uh, thermal mechanisms as a way to drive motion of the legs. And um, to our knowledge, this is the smallest terrestrial robot, and you can see it move here. So we use a laser-based actuation scheme to coordinate the motion uh, and the gait in, the, in these robots. So we're scanning a laser here, actuating these shape memory alloys and causing motions of, of the legs. And you can do all kinds of other things in 3D using, using that kind, kind of scheme. This is sort of a, a jumping kind of like a, a grasshopper type system. This is a, a real, this is real time actually, 1X. One, one we have a laser scanning in this direction actuates those legs and causes the robot to jump around. So in, anyway, we're just dipping our toes into this very exciting field of robotics. Just want to share that with the community here. If you're interested, I'd be happy to speak more in detail. This just appeared a couple weeks ago in uh, Science Robotics. So with that, I think I'm pretty much on time. I'm just going to go ahead and conclude by acknowledging senior collaborators, very collaborative group. We work with many different folks in engineering science. Our core expertise is in uh, material science, but we need computational modeling for the mechanics. We need uh, 
uh, manufacturing, haptics, and uh, you know the interface to the clinical community is critical for uh, pretty much everything that, that we do. But the students and the postdocs are the most important people, so I always like to acknowledge them uh, at the end of uh, in the end of my talks. This is uh, this is the team. Uh, it's a holiday dinner party that we had in December. Everybody's masked up. We dropped the mask, took the picture. Everybody masked up again. But anyway, really talented group group of kids and coming up with a lot of great ideas, working super hard. And I, I, I just talk about this stuff. They, they do it all. So I want to th thank them and uh, thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any. All right. All right. Thank you for the amazing talk. Uh, we have a few questions. Let's start on the right. Yes, uh, thank you very much. That was very interesting. I'm particularly interested in the sensors. And uh, one thing I was curious about is how long do they last and how easy is it to replace them? Yeah, it's a great question. So when we first started on this project, we were deeply engaged with uh, neonatologists at Lurie Children's Hospital. If you take a look at what's done in the NICU, all of the sensors are single use. They throw them away, so they take them off on a 12 or 24 hour cycle, the, the uh, taped on wired uh, sensors, and they throw them out. Because the cost structure is such that the um, risks associated with sterilization and reuse just aren't worth the cost benefit of reusing those uh, sensors. Um, and so they're thrown away. So the devices I described initially were designed with that mode of use in mind. So single use, disposable, throw them away. Um, when we were approached by the Gates Foundation, Save the Children Foundation, we me immediately realized that that mode of use is totally incompatible with the economic constraints in Zambia, Kenya, all these other places, these lower and middle income countries. So for those um, use cases, we had to re-engineer the devices to allow many cycles of use because you need to amortize out of the overall cost structure the cost of the device to get to the price points that are sustainable in those countries, which again correspond to a few cents per patient monitoring day. That's the way you think about it. So the devices have to be reused about a thousand times in order to get there. So they're much more rugged you know, to allow that kind of uh, reuse. Um, so different, two different platforms designed for two different use scenarios uh, is, is maybe part of the answer to your question. But maybe a broader answer, and I'm just going to kind of infer from your question that this is a point of interest for you as well, is how long can the devices stay on? <laughs> and that's determined not so much by the material science of how they're constructed or the choice of adhesive that we're using to bond them to the skin. It's much more limited by natural biological processes of the skin itself. And so the stratum corneum is the very top surface of the skin. It consists of dead, dry cells that serve as a water barrier to prevent water loss through, through the base layers of the skin. But that stratum corneum layer, those dead cells are constantly exfoliating, and they arise from a process of differentiation of cells that start in the base of the skin, migrate, differentiate, end up terminating their lives at that stratum corneum layer, and then exfoliating. The time scale for that cellular elevator process is about two weeks. So if you have a device sitting on your skin, you're preventing that exfoliation. If that's prevented for more than about two weeks, now you're sitting on a very unstable layer of cells that itself is not adhered to the underlying living healthy skin. So your devices just tend to slough off basically, almost like the cells of the stratum corneum itself. It kind of just falls off. So I've worn devices just playing around myself for as long as about four weeks. And at that point, the adhesion just wasn't sufficient to keep it on. So it falls off, and then I was rubbing my finger across that area of the skin. It felt very rough at the location where the device was. Take a piece of scotch tape and you exfoliate that off, you're back to healthy skin. So long answer to your question, but it's really that process that kind of, kind of limits the, the time that the devices can be on the skin. Great, thank you very much. A uh, question on the right. Oh, hi, Ms. Uh, Doctor, uh, hi, Professor Rogers. Thanks very much for the talk. It's such a great pleasure to have this chance to hear your talk. So I have two questions regarding the wearable device. 
So firstly, I want to hear your comment about like how to calibrate them regarding to the measurement of magnitude. So especially considering that they are highly deformable and if we were putting them on the surface of human skin or uh, surface of robots, either rigid or, or the, uh, soft robots, uh, there may be like large scale deformation and very high degrees of freedom deformation. How can you get a like reliable measurement regarding the, the magnitude over the time? So the second question is that I wonder whether you have considered about like making large scale measurement units, like uh, uh, like in the scale of like uh, thousands or tens of thousands or even beyond that. And in this case, what do you think about how to do the wiring and how to do the signal processing? Yeah, yeah, th those are great, great questions. So the first one has to do with stability of and operation of the sensors under deformations associated with motions. And the second question had to do with scale up, I think, and manufacturing to thousands of units and you know, broader deployments. Is that, that correct? Yeah, the second question is specifically about wiring in those cases. So I know fabrication is not a big deal uh, due to the new uh, technology, but the wiring, like how can coordinate wires and how to arrange the wires in those cases, like if there are some existing technologies or uh, technologies in the f near future could be a good solution. So the, you're talking about the wiring? How do, you, yes. how do you manage and route the wiring? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, okay. So, so the first one had to do with uh, stability. And um, what we can do there is you really only need soft mechanics at the system level. It doesn't, in many cases, it doesn't need to be soft throughout the system at a granular level. So if the sensor is sensitive to strains and the sensor performance could change as the skin deforms, we just create a rigid island at that location. So we rigidify the sensor region of the device. The rest of the device, though, is, is still soft and kind of skin compatible. So that, that's kind of what we can do there. It's a little bit harder to do that with antennas because in some cases they have to consume a larger area uh, than, than the sensors do. And so, so there we, we do a lot of uh, electromagnetic, like multi-physics modeling where you couple the electromagnetic response to the mechanical response and the strains and you have to design the antenna to be robust to uh, deformations uh, over a range that's relevant for the particular mounting location. So you have to do that. Uh, in, in many cases, it is doable, but you have to pay deep attention to that. And so that's a, that's a very good, good question. And hopefully that's kind of a practical answer, you know, many details, but roughly those, those are the two strategies, antennas and sensors. Um, for, the, for the wiring, um, I, I guess I'm not, not sure that, that, that I uh, fully appreciate the, the, the question. Um, you know, we, we have design tools, um, circuit design tools just adapted from standard SPICE modeling tools that are used you know, for conventional electronics to do the layout from the circuit level functionality standpoint. And then with our collaborator, Yang Gong Huan, we can um, you know, move the components around, change the lengths and the geometries of the uh, interconnects such that when those circuit components and inter interconnects are embedded in a soft elastomer, we get the effective mechanical modulus that we're interested in. So that is not fully automated. So it's uh, a combined uh, you know, level of intuition and getting things at a reasonable starting point and then iterative cycles of running the mechanics modeling, looking for any stress concentrations that develop on the basis of different types of mechanical deformations and then adjusting the topology to eliminate those areas of concentration. So I guess in the future you could imagine, imagine it being fully automated. Uh, but that's not the way that it's done from a practical standpoint at this point. So, so maybe we do intuitive design that makes sense, and then we'll go through maybe a couple dozen iterations to, to minimize and smooth out any of the concentrations, tweaking the layouts from that standpoint. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, so we have a question up there in the dark uh, on the balcony. Yeah, thanks, for your, thanks for your talk. Um, I have a question about the haptic feedback. So on the forearm, 
it's a lot easier to distinguish two signals, even if they're really close together, as opposed to on the back, the signals yeah. have to be more separated yeah. in order to distinguish. <clears throat> yeah. So I'm wondering if you've done any experiments on kind of scaling up the size of the sensor or having to separate those signals more depending on where you're placing the haptic feedback. Yeah, great, great question. So, so I didn't spend enough time on this slide probably, but <laughs> on, along the, this axis is, what you're getting at, this is the two-point discrimination threshold. So you have two filaments and you push them on the surface of the skin and you ask an individual, does it feel like one or two? And then you continue to increase the separation until they say two. And that, that defines the two-point. But, but look at the, the, the distance scales here. This is three centimeters, four centimeters. So you look at the calf, the two-point discrimination threshold is nearly five centimeters. You look at the uh, finger, like the upper lip, um, the fingertips here, it's more like five millimeters. So it's like a factor of 10 different, but depending on where you are. But if, if you have a haptic array that exceeds the two-point discrimination threshold, it's fine, right? You just you wouldn't, in those instances, need to independently control every actuator. You, could, you can control clusters of actuators, I guess. And so our thought is you don't need to tailor the density and the pitch of the actuator array to the specific body location. You just have to know that you're oversampling the density of tactile receptors uh, in, in the skin, and then you're fine. And so that's what we've done here. This, this, this array has a density that oversamples everything, except, as I mentioned, like the fingers, maybe the upper lip, maybe the toes, something like that. OK, great, thanks. Yeah. Uh, we have actually a line of people up in the darkness of the balcony. Uh, Hi, uh, I have another kind of haptics fiber tactile question. Um, so as far as the longer term applications such as like for prosthetics or um, in terms of controlling robotic manipulators, have you found that um, doing or having long lasting vibrations um, has you found that impacted anything such as uh, phantom vibrations, or how have you overcome those sort of issues for those longer term applications? Great question. I don't know the answer. It's a good question. <laughs> I wouldn't expect that. We haven't, we haven't, of all the human subjects and myself, I've worn these devices, I haven't experienced anything like that. But it may be dependent on the individual, depending on where the device is located, how long it's been operating, things like that. I think it's a great question. We just haven't explored those limits because we haven't noticed like a, a problem. It could be, I mean, there, there could be a problem, but we haven't seen it. Thank you. Yeah. All right, let's take one more question down at the front. Uh, hello, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I know you said that the cost was relatively low pertaining to the medical field in terms of these haptic wearable devices. Kind of what are the main barriers of taking them from a medical uh, situation and bring them to a broader consumer? Uh, market? Like, what are the big, biggest remaining barriers, I guess? I think just like financing, commercial, business-related things, I don't think there's a, a significant te technical challenge that needs to be solved there. So we have a small company, Cybel Health, is doing all the deployments in the, on ICs. They have a deal with Anthem, which is the second largest medical insurer in the, in the U.S. for home deployments, mostly around sleep, sleep apneas. Um, they also have a partnership with Draeger, which supplies uh, hospital equipment. They have a deal with uh, GE. So I think a lot of this stuff's gonna be happening, which you know, for me is pretty exciting. But I think the other consequence is now you have a platform that sort of, sort of works. It reproduces ICU grade data streams that physicians are familiar with. Now you can think about novel sensing modalities and expanding the breadth of measurements that you're making. And so I think a lot of those developments, other companies working this direction as well, and we're not totally unique. I think our approaches are unique, but others are thinking about it. But if you think about synergies around big data and machine learning and advances in, in that field of science, I think there's gonna be tremendous uh, alignment, you know, big health data and, and machine learning. So I, th I think that's likely where things are gonna go in the future, but I don't think there's any fundamental like manufacturing challenge or cost challenge. It's just like a deployment challenge, regulatory challenge, adoption, that kind of stuff. Thank you very much. All right, let's thank John again for uh, his wonderful talk.